Welcome to the Going North Podcast, where we will deliver you tips and techniques to advance yourself in anything you decide to do. I'm your host, author, speaker, and book enthusiast, Dom Brightman, and every Thursday I will interview authors, especially self-published ones, from various walks of life, who will deliver you some inspiration and information to advance yourself. Be sure to check out my book called Going North on Amazon.com, available in both ebook and paperback. And let's get on with the show. All righty, I believe we are. Okay, cool. Recording. We are in, baby. We're in. Oh, yeah. And it's a minute. <laughs> That's right. We're coming to you live from the Brightman Going North Studios. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. Dig it, baby. And for the first freaking guest, we have a three-time district champion within Toastmasters International. In 2013, he was the 19th best speaker in the world. And it was freaking phenomenal. Not only that... Being a champion speaker, he is also a comedian, a vocal artist, and he also has a great audiobook out, and he's also an author. So not only is he reading other people's books, he has written one of his own, and I'm pretty sure he's got one more coming out soon, but I'm pretty sure I'll let him explain more about that. Mr. Sean Purvis, how you doing? Hey, Mr. Brightman, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. Fabulous, baby. Uh, hey, you know how I'm doing? Uh, going north, baby. Going north. That's right. Yes. Not left, but right. Not left, but right. We're going north. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm really glad you're having me on the podcast today. Your very first podcast, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so I'm going to ask some really obvious questions because, of course, you're interviewing me, so I ask the questions. <laughs> That makes absolutely no sense. Whatever, um, Mr. Brightman, in uh, in your uh, in your recent uh, endeavors, you completed a book, and now you're doing a podcast. Why on earth would you do a podcast, Mr. Brightman? Uh, yes, the podcast has actually been an idea in the back of my mind before writing a book even came to me. So probably back in 2013, I had the idea. I was like, hey. Folks have been telling me for years I got this radio voice and people are doing these things called podcasts. You know what? Maybe I'll do one of them one of these days. And then I write the book and then I go, hey, I, I finished the book. It's published. It's written. Audiobook's coming out soon. What is next? Oh, yeah, that podcast. Yeah, yeah. Let me go ahead and do that. Yeah, it's, it's 2017. Got to do something. <laughs> well, very good. So this has been brewing for four years. Oh, yes. Fantastic. I'm very honored. I'm very honored to be on the very first uh, manifestation of Going North. What, what are you calling it, Going North? Yeah, it's called the Going North Podcast. Going North Podcast. Podcast sounds like something you would do in the South, like on the, on the string bean farmers. Like, what are you going to take, pie? We're going to throw me in the river. We're going to the podcast. We cast pods. God with our cast pods. That's right, them pods of praise and pods of adulation. That's all we do here. Have fun. <laughs> Put my hands up. Anyway, so, uh, the book. Uh, so, uh, Dominique, uh, you wrote this book here, buddy. Now, uh, for years, you've been a book lover, a lover of books, so much that you work with them. And then uh, you finally decided to write one. So what went through your mind when you were getting ready to write this book? Like, why? Why do these thoughts need to be committed to paper? Why are they that important? Man, this is like one of those psychiatrists on a chair, man. What the heck? Yeah, it's going to be about your muscles. Yeah. Get back and relax and think about me. <laughs> yeah, the book, I mean, back in... Back in late 2012, I started this journey of reading books voraciously. I 
I started off with audio books and then I got into 21 Laws of Leadership and the rest, the rest of John Maxwell's books, read some more books on psychology, even some business books and leadership, even a bit of sales here and there and body language and psychology and reading all of these great, wonderful books and especially reading one book that mentioned Toastmasters and an audio book mentioned it and then ended up joining Toastmasters and then meeting great people like yourself and ended up writing a book about it and i also learned the fact that you wrote a book yourself called burn the box what i wrote a book say what you're interviewing me as an author what? that's crazy yes yes i did write a i did write a book a wonderful book called burn the box and in, in the in the book i explain exactly why i needed to write the book <laughs> i was tired of the box analogy so, <laughs> so this, so this box analogy, did it ever lead you to want to get into boxing? Oh, uh, no, no, not at all, not at all, not even a little bit. Although, you know, I, I have a, a rare condition where I can watch a movie and then I'll, I'll be all about that movie subject for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> like, really, no, seriously, like, oh man, I went out, what I watched, I watched, uh, what was it? You know, any of the Rocky films. You know, growing up, I'd watch a Rocky film. And after the film, I'm like, you know what? It might not be too late. I should get into boxing. And I will actually think about it. Like, like I will actually run my head through the whole, like, do I want to get hit in the head a thousand times? And no, not at all. I don't want to get hit ever. So, yeah, although the box analogy never made me think of boxing per se... I have thought about a boxing career once or twice in my life. And uh, I remember the last time I bumped my head, and I don't want to pay somebody to do that to me. So. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It, it, it's true, folks. No for me. <laughs> uh -huh. now, now, Mr. Brightman, when you wrote your book, uh, Going North, did you ever, did it ever tempt you to, in fact, go north? But you're going north, it, it it's actually helped me to actually get better if just if everything. It's just a fact that, hey, I, I could take this to a new level. When when you write a book, you realize that, hey, this is, this is really the 21st century business card because you may go to events all the time. Folks may even hand you their business card randomly. But if you hand them a book, they will be ultra impressed because, hey, you took the time and the patience to write something and actually publish it. And two, this is something that can last long after you're gone because a business card, they could probably put that in the trash. Sure, they could put a book in the trash too, but they're not very likely to do that because they're going to keep that on the shelf and they could always go back at a later time and read the book and get some of the ideas out of it and just do whatever. They could possibly be inspired to go out and do more. It's just crazy. You, you bring up uh, amazing points, amazing points. The first uh, great point that you brought up is you're right. It, it is the new business card. A, a business card, you know, it, it, it's more than a business card. It, it's almost like a, a sales circular, a, a, a mailer, if you will. Your book is your expertise. You are exemplifying, proving to someone that you have the thought processes to get through this. If someone's considering you to come out and speak to their company, they want to know what you're going to talk about ahead of time. Now, you could give them a video of your presentation, but then they could just you know, shop a copy around to their people. But a book is going to give a deeper understanding of how you think about things. You know, when people read Going North, they kind of understand your general philosophy. It's not just your day-to-day. -day, it's your overall guidance. So, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. It is the new business card. Uh, the other thing is... It, you are permanent in their lives. When you give someone a book, you're right. It, it, it feels wrong to throw a book away. You know, if anything, they might give it away. They might donate it or try to sell it. Like, I would be so honored if my book was at a yard sale one day that I pulled up to. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've, I've arrived. <laughs> I've, I've arrived. Some, someone, I, have, I am so ubiquitous. What a great Toastmaster word of the day. I am so <laughs> that I am actually getting to the bargain bin at the local yard sale. That's 
I'll be like, sir, the box is in a box at your local yard sale. 50 cents. And, uh, of course, they won't recognize me. I'll turn around the book and be like, does it? Does he look familiar? They're like, no, that'll be 50 cents. I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but, but you, you know, it's amazing. I, I was uh, I was driving around the other day. There's a there's a really slick trick for advertising if you're a store in a strip mall. So say, for example, that you have a small ice cream shop. Dominique's ice cream. I, like, I could see you running an ice cream shop. You have that kind of personality. Like, I would buy ice cream. It, I don't know. It just... You, you seem the type of fella to sell confection. <laughs> you, you do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let, let's say you have Dominique's sweet shop here in a strip mall. Now, of course, you cannot advertise or you you can't like have a billboard out front of the strip mall you know the strip mall already has their own signage so maybe you have just a little sign in a much larger conglomerate sign for that strip mall well a slick trick for marketing is you go to one of those high-end printing companies and get what's known as a vehicle wrap or a car wrap where it's this high-end plastic print of a picture. Uh, you've probably seen them around town, like Sonny's Barbecue is a big one. Like you pull up behind a minivan and the entire thing is covered in pictures of barbecue chicken. You ever seen that? I actually haven't. Okay, well maybe not chicken, but you'll see them. You'll see entire vehicles covered with billboards. Um, you know, it, you kind of get a feeling like the owners drive it or maybe it's a delivery truck or something. Um, but think of like a, a delivery truck that just has pictures everywhere. It is a full 360 degree advertisement. Well, the reason I bring that up is that the slick Dominique Sweet Shop will go out and buy a van, cover it with Dominique Sweet Shop pictures, you know, promos, the whole thing, and then park it right at the street. So even though they don't have a sign per se, there is this giant vehicle below the sign that has Dominique's Sweet Shop written right down the side. You say, Sean, why are you taking on a, this vicious tangent from talking about books? Is that when someone buys your book, even if they never open the actual cover to read it, they will put it on a shelf somewhere or put it in their stack of something on a shelf or, or their library or their table. And every time they pass by that book, they're going to see, going north, Dominique Brightman. And then they're going to go, you know, get something to eat. They're going to pass by that book again. And going north, Dominique Brightman. It is, it is neuro-linguistic programming because you now have an advertisement in their home of your face and your book title. So it's a perpetual business card. It's almost like a billboard in some library. That's, that's pretty stellar stuff, I'm not going to lie. It really is. The information sanctuary is at the library. So speaking of being in boxes at yard sales and being in the business of immortality and advertising from the grave on the shelf of you being an author, what advice would you give to somebody who is looking to write their book and actually publish it? What advice would you give to them? Oh, you are in such a wonderful position nowadays to do that. Uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, you had to crawl through the muck and the mire to get a book published. At that time, there were small vanity presses, what they called, but the advent of technology and the online drop and ship printers are awesome. I personally go through Lulu, lulu.com, uh, they will list your book for you. They will take a percentage of the profits. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're not in it for the charity. <laughs> but they will sell your book online. I've had people go online, buy my book, and it's shipped from the publisher. Uh, I never see anything except the profits come to my end. And it's a beautiful thing. They will also allow you to purchase uh, quantities of your books so that you can actually physically sell your books. Um, and 
and again, Lulu is uh, just one example of the many self-publishing services that are out there. Uh, the first thing, if you want to do a book, obviously, is you have to write a book. I know that. I know that sounds kind of strange, but there's a there's a really big push in content creation to remember that ideas are great, proof of concept is better. I guess a better way to say that is an idea is great, a prototype is better. Hmm. If you say you have a book, oh man, I've got a book. Whew, the story. How many times do you hear somebody say, oh, the stories I could tell. Oh, the stories I could tell. Countless, that, countless times. That is great. I am glad you have stories that you can tell. All I care about is if you have stories that you can write. Because stories you can tell, I can't sell in a printed form. So the first thing you need to do is sit down and commit to write the book. And the way you do that is to commit a portion of every day. Now you say, Sean, do I have to do it every day? No, of course you're not going to do it every day. You're going to skip it. Life gets in the way. You're going to miss it. However, if you commit to it every single day, then if you only get four days a week, you're still way ahead of the game. So commit to a 15-minute window every single day where you sit down near something that you can write with, your computer, uh, if you type faster than you write, great. If you write faster than you type, get a piece of paper and, and just write. It doesn't matter what you write necessarily at first. First, you have to get into the habit of writing. You have to get in, into the idea of expressing your ideas through words, <laughs> which I'm trying to do right now. Uh, the beauty of it is that you just capture those moments. I mean, you when you were writing your book, you captured moments. Right, you captured the aspects uh, of your life, little snippets along the way, lessons you have learned that you're basically now sharing with other people. Very true. You're you're dispensing a lifetime of wisdom, and that's brilliant. It, it's truly, truly brilliant, and it's wonderful that you took the time to do that. And that is the first step of writing a book: is to actually write the book. And even if it is horrible, and I mean horrible, if it is utter garbage. It is still one step closer than you were when you didn't write the book. And you say, okay, Sean, well, now I have a garbage book. That does me no good. Well, the, the key here is that you have to first develop the skill. Mm. Think about anything you've done in life. Uh, cooking is a great example. So many people like to cook. And think about your most elaborate recipe that you've ever tried. Like, oh, I want to try some French crepes or... <laughs> I want to try this one pastry is that if you make a noise, the whole thing explodes and chocolate goes everywhere, you know. So think about the most complicated recipe you've ever made. Now, the very first thing that any recipe is going to assume is that you have done some cooking, period. And I know that sounds weird that a recipe that tells you how to cook is going to assume that you've cooked something else. Because when you look at a recipe, what does a recipe do? It tells you ingredients. Well... It assumes that you know how to measure ingredients. And I know that sounds really basic and it kind of logically it kind of circles on itself for a bit. But the, the point of it is, is that when you first went to cook anything, it seemed impossible. Like the first time you fried an egg. Oh, this is perfect. Let me tell you, Dominique. Have you, do you know how to fry an egg? Can you fry a good egg? Ha <laughs> No. All right. Have you tried? When's the last time you tried to fry an egg? Last time I tried to fry an egg, that was probably that was probably a year ago. Okay, and before that? And before that, I don't even think I ever tried it before a year ago. <laughs> so, so what you're saying is there's there's some kind of like twisted annual egg burning event in the life of Dominique Brightman? Yeah, it's where you make an attempt to cook and then the kitchen turns into an explosive laboratory. Right, the Roiling Inferno. Very good. I like that. So, <laughs> I, will, I will tell you, frying an egg is, is art. When they say cooking is an art, what they mean is everything is an art. Everything is a science, but everything is an art. And what I mean by that is this. The science is how you do it. The art is how well you do it. Mm. Frying an egg, I can tell you how to do it. Turn on the fire under the pan. Crack the egg, pour the egg into the pan. 
when it stops moving and jiggling and it looks like something you could eat, not die from salmonella, take it out of the pan and eat it. <laughs> True. That is the science of cooking an egg or frying an egg. Now the art is okay. Now with my pan, I have to wait about eight to ten minutes for my pan to be at the right heat so that when I drop that egg, I get that. Because I know it's congealing just right so that I'm going to get a good, thick, small egg without it running all over the pan. And then I know I can actually hear an egg frying. I know when it's frying to completion in my pan by the sound it makes. Mm. Now, I didn't know that on the first day I fried an egg. On day 300, I can hear, I'm like an egg whisperer at this point. <laughs> I look at the frying pan and I'm like, with my eyes closed and I'm like humming and I'm like, when the egg calls to me, it's not ready. That's it, man. Like I'm in the zone. And, and that's and that's the beauty of it. So what, the, what egg, frying an egg has to do with writing is quite simple. The first time you try to fry an egg, you will likely burn it or you will serve somebody a salmonella pocket. The hundredth time you go to fry an egg, you will pull out a beautiful, crispy chicken nugget like nobody's business. And that's a pun if you get it. The... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's not a very pun, you have to call it out. The, the beauty of, of writing is like anything you do. When you keep your hand in it, you get better at it. So you, if you want to write, commit to writing 15 minutes a day and your egg will eventually be art. Your writing will be art. I mean, it, 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 tell, tell me about your process, Dominique. When you first sat down to write the book, how, how easy did it flow? To be honest, it didn't really flow too easily in the, be in the beginning, really, because one night, for, for me, it was like after one of those Toastmasters meetings when I went on, my pen was just on fire, I wrote about 14 pages of content with, with just my pen and paper. And then I just basically almost hibernated. I didn't really write anymore after that for about a good two months. And then actually sat down and made an outline of what I wanted to talk about and actually write about. And after making the outline out, things just got a, l a little bit more better, a little bit more clear. So after that, I just went ahead and made the time to get into my place of productivity and actually write down. It's like, hey, I'm going to on a piece on top of this paper, I'm going to write leadership and then write everything that I'm thinking about leadership. Go to the next page, write down time management. What what I know about time management, what have I done to better manage my time and to have control of my life? So that. That's basically the way I, I went about it. I mean, because cause I, I like how you mentioned earlier how it, it doesn't matter if you write faster or type faster than you write. Just just get down and actually write something, even if it's not every day. So has there been a moment like when, or at least what, what would probably be a moment when you were writing your book? What was probably the biggest challenge you had to overcome when you were when you were writing? Honestly, the biggest challenge for me when writing is looking at it twice. Hmm. I, I'm just as you said, when you get that first rush, that first sensational rush, and you sit down with all this energy and this fervor, and you're like, man, I am going north. I'm about to burn a box. I'm about to. Woo. <laughs> and, there, and, and yeah, man, it's just pure adrenaline. You're just sitting there and you're just pounding the keys and you're feeling good and da 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 da. And then the next day happens, and the next day happens, and the next day happens. You're like, oh, I don't feel like doing anything today, you know. And the problem is, is that you, it's to find that perfect blend between sensation and discipline. How to carry on with your book project, even if you don't feel very booky that day. Because as you said, when you first started writing, you get over this hurdle, like you haven't written anything and then you start writing and you, and after a couple days after it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a couple days. It's just two or three times into writing, you start to really see the power of writing and you explode. And it's that new honeymoon phase where everything is wonderful and pretty and flowers smell better and all that good stuff. But then 
that sensation burns out and then you hit a wall and you have all this raw material and all this raw information and all these great stories but that's not how that's not how the book will play out eventually then you need the second part which is the plan the discipline the day by day because if you're not writing your book in a day and you're sitting down to do something in your book then maybe it's an editing day maybe it's a day where you reread chapter one or go through and pick out what would be considered chapter one you know whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, everybody likes chapter breaks it allows us to breathe to to put the book down to go have a sandwich to do something else with our lives people need chapter breaks when they're reading whether it's professional fiction nonfiction what have you so as you said that second part is that plan getting that plan together figuring out how you're gonna work on the book what days you're gonna be writing I'll be honest with you it's better if you write the whole thing first that's what I did I sat down I was furious one day I was so mad I just had enough of people talking about crap <laughs> pardon, pardon my French I know this is an upstanding cast of the pods Honestly, very, very tired of all the BS. Um, I was, I had just sat through one more corporate meeting where someone was like, please, everybody, can we please think outside of the box, please? And I was just like, you know, we could think outside of the box if you would take the time to think outside of the box on that analogy. Mm. That's the same one you've been using for 10 years. And th that's what it is. Corporate culture is so thirsty for new ideas that they forget that they have no new ideas. Like corporate uh, are just a solid, steady idea. People, I, I do not want to get into a political rant, but the, the corporations are just thirsty for these new ideas, and sometimes they lose sight of how old and crusty their ideas are. And... I saw this need, and I said, I am, I'm sick and tired of outside the box. I said, burn it, burn the box. So that's how I got this idea. And I went through, and I started making other metaphors, other analogies. And I got into it so much that I actually explained how to do it in the book. So it, it was a fun process, and I, I love doing it. And I'm now, I'll tell you this, uh, I'm still working on the follow-up. <laughs> You know, let, let's not pretend for a moment like I've mastered this crap. The fact that one book is out is a miracle, but that happened almost a decade ago, and I have, uh, I've got about 35 more books in my head, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, since you said 35 books, do you have any titles in mind? Well, actually, that might be giving away too much. Any, <laughs> not to think about it. Any, oh, is, do you have a set timeline of when your next book might be, when we should look out for the next book that is coming out of the brain of the mighty Sean Purvis? Oh, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But no, no, the, the, the mighty brain of Sean Purvis is not set to drop his next great book, uh, probably in 2017. I'll tell you why, is I'm currently working on my second audio book. I actually have a twofold relationship with books. Not only am I an author, but I read other people's works fortunate enough to work with an author by the name of M.K. Gibson. Hmm. Uh, he wrote a book called To Beat the Devil. It's a Technomancer series set in a future dystopian sci-fi world filled with demons and smart Alec light runners and mages and all kinds of hoorah. Uh, it, it's fun. I, I released, uh, we recorded the first book last year, released at the beginning of the year, and uh, we're working on book two now. So I'm, I'm really excited. There's like five books in the series, so I don't, I don't know if I'm fortunate enough to get all of them, but I'm very excited to have done the first one and working on the second. That is awesome. And speaking of inspiration and other authors, is there a particular book that you would recommend to anybody for inspiration? It doesn't have to be like, an inspirational book to get you inspired to write just something that really inspired you to take yourself to the next level to really go north and advance yourself oh, clearly clearly going north by Dominique Brightman I mean I think that's I, I think that's a given but outside of my present author company there are two books in my life that have so greatly impacted me that I actually bought copies of them and started giving the copies away Nice. You know you love a book when you own a copy. Like when you rent 
you know, nothing against the library. Ah. Uh. <laughs> serve a very necessary function. They allow us to read millions of stories in in a in a format I would never be able to afford. I couldn't afford the assets of a library. So don't get me wrong, a public library is a very beautiful place. But you and I both know that you rent your favorite books, but you'll buy your most favorite ones. So you have a copy. You you don't even read the copy you have at home. It's a really nice one of those like the Franklin Mint presents Going North by Dominique Brightman, printed on 30-pound paper. You know, <laughs> nothing but the finest quality gold lilt gilding for the outside. Blah, 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 you know. So, if, but when you own a book, that means you, you really adore it. But when you own so many copies, you start giving it away. At that point, you become almost like an evangelist because it's like, what are you doing? Well, there are two books that I have given away and one of them is very old. One of them is very new. Uh, the very old one is a little harder read because it's uh, a Roman Stoic philosopher by the name of Seneca. Uh... Yes, yeah, Seneca is one of my favorite uh, philosophers. I've read him um, probably more extensively than others. Uh, the Seneca has a book out by Penguin Books. It's on the shortness of life. Hmm. And it's amazing because the, the, just the title of the book spoke to me because I just felt like my life was just over. I thought, oh man, I just don't have enough time to do all the things I want to do. And I cracked open this book and it was it spoke to me. And it's amazing because this man is 2,000 years away from me and halfway around the world and still connected, as you said. A book is immortal. It, it will it make you immortal, in essence. Your words, Mark Twain is, hasn't darkened this world in many, many years. But the name Mark Twain comes out of the lips of humans every single day. They, he's part of curriculum in school. People fight over his books to even be included in school curriculums. You know, a, a book is, is almost, it, it, it's truly immortality. It, <sighs> Pretty, pretty crazy. I'm sorry, I got off topic. What was the original question? <laughs> yeah, so you actually an answered is like, what book has inspired you the most? But there was another book that you mentioned. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I got off. I got off on the immortal book thing, and I was like, man, that's so cool. I, like, I got lost in a daydream. A really good book, and I don't know how to say his last name, is um, by Eckhart Tolle. I think it's Tolle or Tolle. T O L L. -E. Uh, totally, yes. Good good stuff. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, his book is called A New Earth. Uh, now, A New Earth is actually the second. It, it's like his re-release because in the world of uh, Buddhism, and not, not exclusively to Buddhism, but it, it's kind of very very prevalent in their practice, they have these things called uh, domons, I believe, or koans. Oh, cones, yes. Yeah, cones. They're, they're considered sacred questions. And these sacred questions are what the students ask the teacher, and then the teacher you know, helps illuminate their path by helping them understand that asking the question, you know, there's no sense in it. Like, one example is, why do we wear the seven-panel robe? <laughs> Excuse me. Why do we wear the seven-panel robe, which is the name of the orange robe that Buddhist monks wear? And the answer is, it is good to wear or something. Like, the answer is so non-answerish <laughs> that this Q&A is supposed to bring about enlightenment. Well, Eckhart Tolle's first book, I think it was called, uh, oh, shoot, what is his first book called? Oh, The Power of Now. Yes, thank you. The Power of Now was his first book. The Power of Now has done more in that question and answer format. So it, it can be a little disjointed if you're not used to that kind of Q&A. So it's not like a narrative book, and it's not it's a self-help book in essence, but it's done in that Cohen question and answer format. But after The Power of Now, and that hit Oprah's you know bestseller, so of course he exploded. Um, his second book was really kind of a continuation of the first, the, A New Earth, where he revisits all the topics from the power of now, but in a more narrative format. So he has stories that he's incorporated. And uh, I, I, I found the flow of a new earth to be a little more 
introduce it to reading. So that those are the two books I would highly, highly recommend. Fantastic books. E Eckhart Tolle has a real perspective on how to put life in perspective. You know, how, how to keep the important things important and how to realize that everything else is just not very powerful. Yeah. Very powerful indeed. Way we can follow you, keep keep in contact with you. Like, what's your social media handles and all that magical smooth jazz? Oh, you want to find me on the social medias, do you? Uh, the social media. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any. You can follow my Twitter. <laughs> facebook.com forward slash sean purpose i used to make fun of people that only had facebook accounts and then i realized that they're so much more valuable than the website i've been paying for for far too long if you would like to visit my virtual money pit <laughs> okay sorry sean purpose.com s-h-a-w-n-p-e-r-v-i-s.com yeah you can visit my store on there all three items oh where you can get a copy of my book hey -o. That is right. That was Sean Purvis, ladies and gentlemen. Follow him on social media. Pick up his ebook, Burn the Box, so that way you can burn the old box that you want to get out of. That's right. Thanks a bunch for your tuning ears on the Going North podcast. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Be sure to, once again, check out my book, Going North, on Amazon.com and CreateSpace.com. And if you'd like, feel free to follow me on social media at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all at Dom Brightman, YouTube at Dom Brightman. And if you want to connect on LinkedIn as well, I am there at Dom Brightman as well. Go out there 